Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Glenshaw. I'm a writer and editor for the Smithsonian's Air and Space Magazine, and I lecture uh, and give tours for the Smithsonian Associates about aviation, art, and history. I'm delighted to be with you this afternoon to share with you the really epic story of the Wright brothers and the race to be first. Um, you know, it's funny, it's one of those famous moments in history. We kind of know how the race ends, but the story that there was actually a race going on is, is typically not really well known. So we're going to jump on in and see how some fat meet some fascinating characters and, and uh, see how this all played out. It's really quite an epic story. We'll begin since we're joined, coming from all sorts of different places around the world. Um, at least we are all here on our lovely planet Earth and to get us in the right place. We're going to start someplace you might not expect. Lexington, Virginia. Not especially famous in the world of aviation history, but it was there in late December of 1903 that a letter arrived for one Mr. Charles M. Manley. It was sent by Octave Chanute. And this letter, which we see here, contained information that I really wonder how Mr. Manley responded to it. I think sometimes maybe it broke his heart. The letter in its second paragraph says, I had a telegram on the 17th stating that the Wrights had that day made four successful flights from a level against a 21 mile an hour wind, the average speed through the air being 31 miles an hour. The longest flight was 57 seconds. Only a few weeks beforehand, Charles Matthews Manley nearly lost his life attempting to be the first successful pilot of a heavier than air manned controlled powered airplane. What a thing to receive. This is the moment that Charles Manley found out he'd lost. So let's find out all the backstory to who this guy was, this brilliant young engineer um, who had come to work uh, for the Smithsonian Institution for the most renowned scientist in the United States of America, Samuel Pierpont Langley. He was his special assistant and he was chosen to be the, the pilot of what was known as the Grand Aerodrome. They form one team in our great race to be the first to fly. The other is of course, Orville and Wilbur Wright of Dayton, Ohio. Let's take a quick look at these two teams and then we'll go into their stories. So Samuel Pierpont Langley, who we see there, the elderly gentleman, um, at the time of uh, this, these events, uh, 1903, was 69 years old. He'd come from Boston, Massachusetts. Interestingly, he had not gone to college, but had become the most renowned scientist in the United States of America. Um, he had been the director of the Allegheny Observatory. As we'll see, he became renowned for his work on uh, sunspots and other solar phenomena. And he'd become the secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, he was a very famous astronomer and scientist, very, very well respected in the, in the uh, scientific community around the world and that he had thrown in his lot for flight, for human flight was a very big deal. It really advanced what the, the reputation and the possibility that flight might become real. And he had already by this time created successful heavier than air powered flying machines. They just didn't have people on them. Charles Matthews Manley, a much younger man by more than 40 years. He was 27 years old when all this went down. Uh, as I said before, he was the special assistant to the secretary um, and uh, a graduate of Cornell University from 1898, a very brilliant um, a young engineer with a lot of potential. On the other team, Wilbur Wright, age 36. He was a non-graduate of Central High School in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, he had enough credits to graduate, but simply didn't go. Um, at this point, he was a bicycle shop co-owner with his brother. He had formerly owned a print shop with his brother. And at this point, he was known in aeronautical circle as a designer and builder of gliders that he himself flew. Pretty much the same story for his brother, Orville Wright, who was five years younger, 32 years old, also a non-graduate of Central High School of Dayton, Ohio, also bicycle shop co-owner, print shop, 
designer builder of gliders. We have two guys joined in so many ways. And so to as is as equals. So it's very interesting to look at these two teams in comparison to one another. Team Langley, you've got both people who are working for the Smithsonian Institution, an arm of the federal government. Team Wright, completely independent researchers, all on their own. Manley works for Langley. Langley is the boss. Langley is senior to Manley. The Wright brothers are brothers. They are, you know, siblings are the ultimate of peers. And that's who they are, co-equals. Langley is the most renowned scientist in the United States. He is risking his reputation and the reputation of the Smithsonian. The Wright brothers, nobody knows them. They're not risking any reputation as scientists or engineers because they really don't have one. If we go on. Langley, as we said, is the preeminent scientist in the United States. The Wright brothers totally obscure, but no, starting to be known in aeronautical circles. Langley does have proven success with powered flying machines. The Wright brothers have proven success with gliders. Langley's funding comes from the US government. The Wright brothers funding comes from their bicycle shop. Finally, of the four men you see on your screen, only one of them is university trained. The most junior of them all, Charles Manley. He's the only one with a university degree. The rest of them are self-taught. So that's the layout. Those are our teams. What they have in common, they're both extraordinarily committed to this quest to create the airplane. They are very brave, not only in terms of what it means to their reputations in the world, but what it could mean to them physically. This could kill them. They work incredibly hard. They're tremendously industrious. They are fantastically detail-driven and uh, detail-oriented and data-driven. They really look at what they're building and making and testing it to make sure it works. And they are willing to risk everything, truly everything. So that's the setup. Let's jump back in time and move from the, do some backstory that gets us to the actual race that happens in earnest in 1903. So we're gonna jump back to um, earlier in, uh, in time. We're gonna jump from um, Lexington up to the Smithsonian Institution. Here we are looking down on the castle in the beautiful garden out back. And we're just a quick little review of where flight was at this point. Now, were the Wright brothers the first people to fly? No. Human beings started flying in France in 1783 with the Montgolfier brothers in balloons. Were they the, fl the first to fly a heavier than air machine with a human being on board? No. So George Cayley started designing and building gliders in the 1820s and 30s and 40s, and a 10-year-old boy flew on one of his in the 1840s. So no. Were they the first to create a heavier than air powered flying machine? Well, here's the idea of one from Stringfellow and Henson in the 1840s in England. And you can see that the layout of what we would come to know as the modern airplane has already been fairly well conceived. You see a, a monowing airplane. This one has propellers in the back, but it's got a cabin with wheeled uh, landing gear. It's flying clearly over the Great Pyramids. It's a machine of industry and of transportation. So the concept was definitely there. But if you look there in the center of your screen, you see what's called the planophore by Alphonse Penneau, who um, started building um, these little models made with, that were powered by twisted rubber. And you can see there the layout of an airplane. The propeller is in the back and it doesn't have a vertical tail, but you see the wings and the stabilizer in the back. And so these concepts about what were the elements of an airplane had been developing all through the 19th century. Now, this brings us to who Samuel Pierpont Langley was and what he had achieved at this point when he gets into aeronautical investigation. What you're looking at right now is, uh, and I have an art background, so I love this picture, but this is a drawing that Samuel Pierpont Langley did of a sunspot. He drew it himself. He was an extraordinarily gifted draftsman. He learned it in high school. 
He'd worked at the Harvard Observatory after high school. He'd worked for the Naval Academy at their observatory. And he'd been the director of the Allegheny Observatory uh, since 1867. This is an 1873 drawing of one of his sunspots. And so this is really this work in solar observation is what brought him his reputation. But when he attended a meeting in uh, Buffalo, New York in 1886 for the American Association of the Advancement of Science, there was a lecture given there, an actual whole session on the possibilities of human flight. And it had been organized by a guy named Octave Chanute. And while it, during the session, a professor, Israel Lancaster, spoke about some experiments that he had been doing. The, the lecture was met with a lot of skepticism amongst all these well-known scientists, one of whom was Langley, but Langley was hooked. He got interested in the idea. He went back to Allegheny. He constructed uh, a, uh, a machine of the diagram you see here. It's called a whirling arm or a whirling table. And this was a big giant spinning machine that you could put a surface on a wing of different sizes and spin it and see what it did, see how it lifted, see what kind of drag it created. And he did everything, all different sorts of model wings, even bird wings um, he put on this. So his investigations began in Pittsburgh. And as I mentioned, the guy who put this all together was Octave Chanute. Chanute was born in Paris in the eight, early 1830s, but he'd been raised in the United States and he had become a very well-respected railroad engineer. He designed the Chicago and Kansas City stockyards. He was a very renowned guy. And in his retirement, he got very interested in the ideas about human flight and what was possible. And he approached it as an engineer. And this is what's really important with Langley and Chanute. You see Chanute, who's this great engineer, who's looking at the problem of flight as an engineer. You're seeing Langley, who's a scientist, looking at it as a scientist. What are things we can know and learn and find out to see if this can happen? Chanute also starts gathering information from all over the world and making connections with people who are also investigating the possibilities of flight. So very important guy. We'll be definitely coming back to him. Langley becomes the secretary of the Smithsonian um, in 1887, the third secretary of the Smithsonian. Here we see the famous castle building in Washington, DC. And he continued his experiments in heavier than air powered flight at the castle. Um, he did a lot of observation of birds. Here you see a buzzard being observed um, from the roof of, <laughs> of the castle. I don't think you could get away with that today. Um, and here we see some of his very first attempts at building airplanes, um, somewhat uh, modeled on the planophore that we saw earlier of Alphonse Peno. Um, they're quite strange looking little crafts, but they were all powered by rubber bands. And he was building and flying rub rubber band powered models in the Smithsonian. And they, some of them were successful, some of them were not. You see those strange sort of half moon shaped things on the top right hand pictures. Those are his attempts at interesting designs for propellers. Um, but Langley was very serious about this. And so starting off with models, not worrying about control, just worrying about, you know, what kind of surface lifts a machine through the air, what sort of power do you need, et cetera. Very simple and easy way to get going. But he started working on designs for much bigger models, thinking ahead towards what human flight could be. And what you see here are the very first airframes that he started building for bigger models, something of substantial mass and size that could carry a significant amount of weight. He investigated all different sorts of materials, of power plants, um, carbonic acid engines, um, all different sorts of things, uh, and finally wound up, up with steam engines. And you can see how the design is starting to evolve. At the beginning, it's sort of this A-frame shape, then you start to see a sort of cruciform shape developing. And this is where he wound up. Um, this is his aerodrome number five of 1896 and his aerodrome number six of 1896. These are the original uh, aircraft. These are large models. Um, you'll see some photographs of them, get you a sense of scale. They were both designed, powered rather, by steam engines, beautifully designed little miniature steam engines, everything designed to be lightweight and strong. Um, he had these pairs of tandem wings with propellers pushing the airplane forward. So you see this tail in the background, that's the back of the airplane. Uh, the way we're looking at it right now, the airplane is above us and flying away to the right. 
Now, he did not test these models at the Smithsonian, but rather about an hour south driving now, uh, right near Marine Corps Base Quantico, at a place called Chapawamsic Island. Um, and it was at this little island that he devised um, a launching method on top of a houseboat. And here's a map of the island at the time. Um, and they would park the houseboat down there. It had a catapult up top, and this is where they would conduct their tests. Now, Langley's experiments up to this point in May of 1896 had mostly failed. The rubber band powered airplanes didn't fly very well. It took a long time and a lot of failures to get to the right kind of propeller, right kind of engine, and so on. And it was in May 1896 that they went down to launch these larger number five and number six aerodromes. And uh, they didn't work well at all until May the 6th. So here you see the houseboat. There you see the model on the houseboat. And you see one of the Smithsonian staff there on the ladder. That gives you an idea of the scale of the machine. On May the 6th, number five worked. Number five worked beautifully. It flew for the first time for 3,300 feet and the second time for 2,300 feet. This is an extraordinary accomplishment. This is a substantially sized, heavier than air, powered flying machine that has flown. It's missing two key elements that make it an airplane. It doesn't have a pilot and it doesn't have controls, but all the other elements are ticked. There it goes. Um, number six, about a month later, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, about six months later, November of that year came down and turned in an extraordinary flight of 4,790 feet. So Langley has achieved a monumental goal in the history of flight, um, something that had never been done. This was so far ahead of anything that had been done. And Langley put it out there that he was essentially done. He had no more to do uh, with flight. He'd done what he'd set out to do. However, he was actually already starting to look for funding to make a machine that he could put a person in. So we're going to go back to this man, Octave Chanute, because the Wright brothers aren't involved yet. There's another tease. Octave Chanute is very important to the Wright brothers. And then there's another character, Otto Lilienthal, who the Wright brothers never met, but who was critical to their getting involved in flight at all. Otto Lilienthal was born in May of 1848 in Prussia. He was a very uh, gifted young man who went to engineering schools in, in Prussia, in Germany. And he became interested in um, aeronautical experiments in the 1860s. They were interrupted when he had to serve in the Franco-Prussian War, but he started, like Langley had, doing whirling arm experiments. The whirling arm was actually quite a well-known instrument by this point. Sir George Cayley had one. Another, a number of other experimenters had used the whirling arm to test various surfaces on how they could lift. And Lilienthal picked up on this. And the main focus for Lilienthal was birds. As you see on the right, this is an illustration from his seminal book called Bird Flight as the Basis of Aviation, which was published in 1889, where he was, look and he was one of the first to really definitively state that the best surface for creating lift, a, a surface moving through the air was a curved surface, like the surface of a bird's wing, as you can see in that diagram. Um, this was a very important thing and Lilienthal was the kind of guy not to just put out a theory, but to actually test it himself. Um, and he did this by creating his own designs of gliders. Now he's taken a very important piece out of the puzzle for getting to the airplane, which is power. He is interested in building surfaces that can sustain a human being and being able to control himself in the air. And to learn how to do this, he risks his life by flying. He creates a man-made hill near his home in Prussia, and he begins designing and building and flying gliders. This and Langley's achievement are right up with one another. 
because Langley has created this powered airplane that flies, doesn't have person on it. Lilienthal is actually flying through the air. He doesn't have power, but he's able to fly. And not once, not twice, but thousands of times in multiple surface gliders, many, many different designs, many, many variants. Now, I was extraordinarily lucky in December of 2019 to have been invited down to the Outer Banks of North Carolina to witness the flights of a perfect and absolutely exact reproduction of an 1896 Lilienthal glider. And so I'm gonna show that to you now. There you go. That's a glider that was designed uh, and well, well designed by Otto Lilienthal, but the reproduction was built by Dr. Dr. Marcus Raffel of the German Space Agency, um, who is himself a glider pilot and airplane pilot and helicopter pilot. Very accomplished guy who wanted to experience for himself how Lilienthal's gliders flew. So he's built now a few reproductions exactly using the same materials, willow branches for the wings and um, a treated cotton fabric that he had reproduced exactly as Lilienthal's had been, and then teaching himself how to fly. Now you see, really the only kind of control that he had was being able to move his body. That was Andy Bean, the, the uh, hang glider pilot and instructor who was flying the Lilienthal glider there. Um, Lilienthal controlled his machines by weight shifting. And this was effective up to a point. Um, up to a point in 1896 where he lost control of a glider and crashed and was killed. Octave Chanute also is investigating gliders at this time, um, also in 1896, but he was flying them off Lake Michigan. And you see Augustus Herring here, one of his assistants in this glider, which was launched off the side of a hill and it has two wings stacked on top of one another, a biplane, first time it's been done in this way with this solid Pratt truss. Chanute and his design is incredibly important to the Wright brothers. They basically adapt his design to some ideas they have about control. So this is all the backstory because now we need to find out who the Wright brothers are. The Wright brothers um, read this book that you see on the right by Chanute called Progress in Flying Machines. And the publication of this book brings all the knowledge of all the experimenters from around the world into a single volume. Very important. So now let's meet the Wright brothers. Wilbur writes a letter. I am afflicted with the belief. We'll see that in a minute. So let's leave Chapawamsic Island. Langley, as I said, had returned to the Smithsonian. Um, he was starting to look at possibilities for funding for a large scale machine. Um, but where our story takes us next is out to Dayton, Ohio. And we're gonna come down from up above, down to the West End, to 7 Hawthorne Street, where you don't see a house. It's right there in the center of your screen. You see the outline on the ground of where a house used to be. This is 7 Hawthorne Street, where the Wright brothers uh, lived for a great portion of their lives and where they did all the work that resulted in, in the invention of the airplane. Um, here is a picture of the house. Uh, when it was in Ohio, it is now at the Henry Ford uh, Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan, the entire house and their bicycle shop. Um, this is a very important uh, place, this little house. Uh, this is where some real genius work happened. Doesn't look like the Grand Smithsonian Institution, does it? It was in 1896 when uh, Lilienthal was killed um, that Orville Wright was recovering from typhoid fever. And his brother Wilbur, they were very close. Um, there were actually four Wright brothers. They, they were the two younger brothers um, and they had a younger sister, Catherine. Um, but Wilbur was helping his brother, brother recover and they read about Lilienthal's death in the newspaper. It was not unusual to hear about Otto Lilienthal in the newspaper. He was a human being who was actually flying. He was quite renowned for what he'd been doing. Um, 
And when Lilienthal died, it was one of the things that spurred the curiosity of the Wright brothers to wonder well, why, what happened. And it was the perfect question to come to these two guys. They'd been raised by a bishop in the United Brethren Church who had inspired and cultivated intellectual curiosity in his children. They had a wonderful library at home. They had been trained by their mother, who was the one who was mechanically gifted in the family and who could design and build things. And it was these two boys who grew up very close as siblings. They designed sleds and printing presses and um, they got into the bicycle business. Um, they were very much two halves of the same coin. Orville, as you saw earlier, was younger by about five years and Wilbur was, um, Wilbur was the older. And when you read their letters, their personal letters to each other, you can tell sometimes there's definitely a civil, sibling rivalry, but they're also very close, a very dynamic team. Um, when they got interested in flying machines, they were uh, they owned and operated their own bicycle shop. The bicycle was incredibly popular at this point. The bike kind of as we know it today had come into its own. Uh, they both raced bicycles, they built and designed bicycles, they repaired bicycles. Um, and this is kind of where they were in their lives. But all their mechanical skills had kind of come together by this point. Um, they knew about designing building machines. And this idea of what went wrong with Lilienthal was a key question for them. And so they started where you should really always start when you go to investigate something that you don't know about, which is to read everything that's come before. And that's that letter that Wilbur wrote. Um, the first one was to Octave Chanute. They figured out who was the guy who knew more about flight than anybody, and they landed on Chanute. And Wilbur wrote this now very famous letter in 1900 to Chanute. Dear sir, for some years, I have been afflicted with the belief that flight is possible to man. My disease has increased in severity, and I feel that it will soon cost me an increased amount of money, if not my life. Wilbur lays it down. You know, this is a dangerous business. He knows it could cost him his life. Um, a year earlier, though, he'd actually written a letter. Here we see May 30th, 1899. He'd written a letter to the Smithsonian Institution because it was Langley who had achieved this remarkable milestone. And so by writing to the Smithsonian and to Chanute, the, the Wright brothers began by studying everything that had come before. And years later, Orville Wright would say, you know, our inspiration went all the way back to da Vinci and the Montgolfiers and Cayley and Lilienthal and Langley. Um, they looked at everything that had come before and they landed on the idea that what was really needed was a system of control, power, Langley had been working that out. Getting a human being in the air, Lilienthal had been working that out. They figured they could solve power, and certainly machines were big enough that a human could get in the air, but Lilienthal lost control and crashed. So how do you balance a machine in the air? They're used to balancing on bicycles. How do you balance a machine in the air? And that's where their investigations began. This is the only evidence that we have, or surviving evidence, I should say, of their very first flying machine, which was a kite, a little kite, about six foot wide wingspan, that whose wings could twist. One side went down, the other side went up. Wilbur had seen buzzards flying and seen them twist their wings when they turned. So he thought that might have something to do with it. And when he flew this little glider and twisted the wings, one side went down, the other side went up. And then he did it the other way and the opposite happened. So he realized he had something, a method of rolling a machine in the air and achieving equilibrium, achieving balance. So it was on this principle that they felt they could contribute some small thing to this effort, which was a workable control system. So we're not yet at a race though. It's gonna happen, all the pieces are coming together. We have the two teams already, um, but we're not quite at a race. In 1898, the United States goes to war, the Spanish-American War. Langley had been hoping to get federal funding to um, scale up his successful models into a machine that could carry a human being. He approaches the military. Here we see General Nelson Miles, the chief of the army. Um, and a proposal is made to the military and he is granted $50,000 in 1898. It is at this point that he writes to a good friend at Cornell University seeking an assistant 
and the assistant recommends Charles Matthews Manley. So that's how Manley and Langley come together. And Manley is sent down to help Langley on all aspects of the aerodrome. Here we see, uh, we looked at the garden in the back of the uh, castle. This is the shed that was in that space. And this is where the work was done on the Grand Aerodrome, it was rather a large staff. And the biggest problem that Langley had at this point in his mind was getting a suitable engine. Um, you can see all the different kinds of things that were being built um, and the different kinds of surfaces that were being created. They approached a uh, automobile engine manufacturer in New York City named Balzer. And Balzer had created this little engine for this little very early car. And it was a gasoline powered engine and they hired him to design and build the power plant that they were going to need for the Grand Aerodrome. They gave him his money, he spent all of it working on it and could not get the engine to produce enough power. Ultimately, Charles Manley took over that portion of the project. And as you'll see, it was his crowning achievement of the whole thing. But at this point, the Langley team dynamics are set. We've got the young, promising engineer working for the older, established scientist. So from Dayton, the Wright brothers would travel down to the Outer Banks of North Carolina to begin their, their full up experiments flying gliders. This is where Wilbur landed at what's now Kitty Hawk, North Carolina in 1900. Just imagine the space without roads, houses, shops, or anything. Uh, here we see the Wright brothers at about this time, entering their 30s and really taking on the, the project that would consume the rest of their lives. From that little kite, they designed a much larger glider in 1900. And here you see it flying. You can actually see the, the beach there in the background of the shot. They flew it first as a kite, once again, to test their wing warping mechanism, as they called it, to see if it would turn, and it did. The problem was the glider was too small. They couldn't find lumber long enough to build the wings in the shape, size that they needed. And so they had a much smaller glider. They flew one of the local kids on the glider and got a few small glides in themselves. So it was really a promising start, but it really didn't give them the hours of flying experience that they had hoped for. So they come back the next year with a much larger glider. They bring all the materials with them this time. And this glider is essentially the same design, but a much bigger uh, wing area to help lift them into the air. And again, they flew it as a kite. Um, and they noticed that it didn't lift very well, not nearly as well as they had hoped. Um, here's a picture of it on its end. So you can see the size of it with Orville standing next to it. Uh, Chanute at this time has become very well known to the Wright brothers and vice versa. He comes to visit them with some of his own gliders to make experiments. The Outer Banks is a wonderful place to do it. Lots of steady wind and lots of sand. Um, and here you see a picture of the 1901 glider actually flying and advancing into the wind. So there was some problems with this machine, but also looked like it was going somewhere. And Wilbur was the only one to fly it and in fact did make many flights in this glider, some at longer than 300 feet. And they considered this a step in the right direction, but the glider had all sorts of problems. When they turned right, it ultimately turned, swung around and turned left. It, they needed much more wind than they expected. There were a lot of problems with this glider and they basically had to go back to uh, Ohio and start over again. There was something wrong with the design. Here you see Wilbur after a landing and one of the great sand dunes uh, in the background that they would fly off of. So back in Ohio, Orville and Wilbur really look at the problem of the, of the design. And this is where the breakthroughs happen for both teams. For Team Langley, it's that engine. Manley brings Balzer's engine back to Washington and completely redesigns it. And the first thing he does is double the horsepower. He's ultimately able to get this engine up to 52 horsepower and run it for 10 hours without stopping. Um, it is absolutely a masterpiece. It's, if not the first, it's one of the first radial engines ever designed. Um, and it's brilliant. It's going to produce more than enough power for Langley's design for the full-scale aerodrome. So the big problem that they'd set out to solve, they solved. 
Um, here you see a picture of it as it is today and in a dynamometer when they tested it at this time. They also built a quarter scale version of the aerodrome with a quarter scale gasoline engine and successfully flew it. Um, the first quarter scale flight was in 1901 in June and it flew again um, in 1903, um, this quarter scale model. So they had a successful, so the design flew again and they had the engine. So really they considered their problems solved. For Team Wright, they scrapped all of their wing designs, which they had based on Otto Lilienthal's data and decided to gather their own data. They created a wind tunnel and tested over 200 airfoils in this wind tunnel. And here you see this balance that they had on the right and the little model airfoils that they built. And what's fascinating about what they did is they just didn't know the shape of a wing. So you can see these, there's different shapes there on the left, rectangular ones, square ones, they had flat ones, curved ones, all different shapes and sizes. But if you look at this table of data that they gathered from making tests of these surfaces, you can see the surface area right across the top is all six square inches. So they all had the same area, they were just different shapes. And by putting the different shapes through the same tests, they could see which ones lifted better, and which ones didn't. And they started seeing that long skinny wings were gonna be what they needed. That was just a huge breakthrough. Um, and here you see a letter um, and diagram and um, definitions that Wilbur sent to Octave Chanute. The Wright brothers did all their scientific work on the back of the algebra and trigonometry they learned in high school. So you remember their 1901 glider? didn't fly so well. So they come back with a glider in 1902 that has the same surface area as 1901, but when they test it as a kite, it flies straight up over their heads. They've got the shape of the wing right. Now they can test their control system for real because it's really going to carry them. And they've added a tail. They've figured out how the aircraft is actually going to turn in the air. So it's taken them three years to solve their problem of control. And the Wright Brothers 1902 glider is the first heavier than air controllable flying machine. It just doesn't have power, but they're getting to that. And I have to show this picture. This is my daughter flying a reproduction of it. Um, uh, a promise that I had made to her that I, that I kept. So now we get to the race and it is on. 1903, Team Langley. Uh, here you see behind the castle, Charles Matthews Manley in the aerodrome under construction. Um, they moved back down to Quantico, a much bigger houseboat this time with a similar sort of catapult launching system as they'd used with the in 1896. Um, and by this point, Manley had really become the supervisor in charge of the entire project. He was overseeing every aspect of the aerodrome's construction and testing, but he still worked for Langley. So Langley called the shots, but Manley was in charge of the day-to-day -day, and this causes friction. Um, so here you see it ready for its first test in October of 1903. And it was through the summer and the fall and the early winter of 1903 where this race happened. Let's jump to team right. So the Wright brothers have a controllable flying machine, but they don't have power. I'm gonna show you a little bit of video right now so you can hear and see what their engine looked like. This is a reproduction made by the Wright Experience of Warrington, Virginia. Okay, fuel on. So as you can see there, the, um, the engine is really loud. It's honestly not very good. Um, when I was working with the team who reconstructed that, the airplane and the um, engine and so on, engineers at Ford Motor Company evaluated the engine and, and part of what they, their result was that it had good days and it had bad days. Not a very good engine, but it gave them enough power, not nearly as much as the Langley engine, but what the Wright brothers had was the propeller. And that was the key breakthrough that they had in 
in creating the airplane because they'd worked out that the propeller wasn't just like the propeller of a ship. It was actually a wing moving in rotation, creating lift for a propeller that's called thrust. They also knew that the outer tip of the prop moved a lot faster than what was closer to the hub. So working out what that shape of the propeller should be to generate the most lift, you could get a lot of thrust out of a not very well-powered engine. And this was the key that got the Bright Brothers to be able to fly. So the heat race really heats up in the fall of 1903. Back to Team Langley. Charles Matthews Manley, uh, here you see him as the aerodrome is coming together down near Quantico. And this is the kind of letter he was getting from his boss, the secretary of the Smithsonian, complaining about delays. They'd had the engine blow up and crack up some of the airplane. And uh, Langley is losing patience. So Langley's up at the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C., writing letters that say things like this. I am nearly at the end of my rope, boy. Now, poor Manley um, receiving a letter like this from, from his boss, the secretary of the Smithsonian, is under tremendous pressure. He also knows what's at stake. This is a document he created um, sometime before, but while he was well into the project. It's his will leaving everything to his brother. He's 27 years old. He knows that this thing might kill him. And it was on October 8th, 1903, that Team Langley gave it a shot. They're publicly funded. Langley's publicly known. All the newspapers come down to see him try. Langley's at the controls. I'm sorry, Manley is at the controls. Very important, Manley's at the controls. He throws the switch for the um, catapult. The engine is at full power. And this is what happens. It goes straight into the water. This is a photograph taken from the boat as the aircraft left the launching track. It went into the water. Uh, Manley was unhurt, uh, extensive damage to the machine, but they'd already built spare wings, spare everything. So it was not a big matter to bring the aerodrome back to Washington and rebuild it for another try. But the press was howling with laughter. Go to Team Wright. They're back down on the Outer Banks of North Carolina, completely secluded. Nobody knows them. Hardly anyone knows they're there. They construct what they call their Whopper flying machine. It's basically a very big scaled up version of the 1902 glider but now with the engine and the propellers on board. They have a lot of mechanical difficulties in getting the aircraft ready to fly. And it's not until they start in October of 1903, getting this machine ready. And it's not until December because of all the delays that they're ready to try. They know that Langley has already failed once and they know he's gonna try again. And this is where the race is really on. In December of 1903, they know that Langley has a machine that's big enough. They know that it's big enough to lift Manley through the air. He doesn't have a very good control system. All he can do is move that big tail around the back, but they've got that incredible engine. But the Wright brothers know that they've got a machine that they can control. They've proved that. They've done over 1,200 flights in that 1902 glider, but they've never tried this one. And it's after they do a thrust test on this airplane and the airplane pulls enough sand through, uh, through a pulley that tells them that they've got enough thrust to move the airplane forward under its own power, that they know they've got it. It's just a matter of trying. Here's a beautiful detailed shot of the machine that has existed just before their first flights. So let's jump back to Team Langley. Langley does not go back to Quantico. Instead, he stays very close to the Smithsonian, to a place called Haynes Point, which is at the confluence of the Potomac and Anacostia rivers. And it's here on December 8th with a very impatient United States military wondering where all their money has gone, when is this thing going to fly, that Langley and Manley are pressured into making another attempt, again with the press watching. They couldn't have picked a worse day. It took most of December the 8th to get the aerodrome ready to launch. The wind was very volatile, switching directions, 
you know, all the time. They're out on the Potomac, which is covered with chunks of ice. It's very cold. Um, and the sun is going down. It's late in the day by the time they attempt the launch. And this is the photograph that was taken of the launch. If you can see my cursor moving around, that's Charles Manley. And right now, he's holding on for dear life because the aerodrome went down the track. He said he heard a terrible grinding noise. The powerful engine got the airplane to hover vertically for a second while the whole back half of the aircraft destroyed itself. It hovered for a second and then collapsed into the water backwards, trapping Manly underneath, in the ice, in all the wires. He had to rip off his clothes and miraculously got out from the tangled wreck of the aerodrome. He was picked up and this very mild mannered son of a minister apparently let out a string of blue language the likes none of them had ever heard. Team Wright. December 14th, 1903, the Wright brothers toss a coin to see which one of them will try. They've heard about Langley's disaster. The press was howling about it once again. And Orville said, well, Langley's had his turn to throw. Let's see what happens with us. They were confident, but they'd never tried this machine. And when Wilbur did, he won the coin toss. He broke the airplane, launched it too soon. They had actually on the side of a sand dune. He lifted it up and their airplane too rose up for a second and then came down hard and he broke one of the front skids. Three days later though, they took the, the machine out, not the glider, the airplane out, uh, pointed it into a very gusty but very straight wind, uh, set it up on its track. Here you can see their footprints in the sand outlining the wing of the machine where it stood. Wilbur ran alongside this aircraft with his brother at the controls, his brother getting his turn after having lost the first coin toss. And at 1035 on December 17th, 1903, the race was over. Orwell Wright flew for 120 feet in 12 seconds. There were three more flights that day. Now, I was also fortunate enough in 2003 to be at this same place with the wonderful team of the Wright Experience who had recreated the 1903 flyer and witnessing their first attempt to fly the machine built exactly as Orville and Wilbur had it, same propellers, same engine, same everything. And this was their first attempt. That was 97 feet, so 13 feet short of what Orville first did. Um, I wanted just to go back to this close-up of the picture. This was taken by a man who'd never taken a photograph, and to just show you the Wright brothers' confidence, Orville pre-aimed and pre-focused the camera and got this perfect shot. As I said, there were th three more flights. This is the third flight by Orville. Wilbur did the second, and then Wilbur turned in the monster flight of the day, 52, 59 seconds, 857 feet. Um, proving without a doubt that this aircraft could fly on its own, under the control of the pilot, under its own power. The Wright brothers had won. The wind came and tossed the airplane. He, Wilbur broke it on landing, um, and then the wind came and tossed the airplane and destroyed it. It never flew again. Uh, this is the famous telegram that the Wright brothers sent home, saying success four flights Thursday morning. They had done it. And so that brings us back to where we started but the letter that Charles Matthews Manley received from Octave Chanute saying the Wrights had that day made four successful flights. And again, I can only imagine how it made that young man feel. The whole story ends with really a mixed bag. Uh, it destroyed Samuel Pierpont Langley. It ruined his reputation. Uh, he aged dramatically, as you can see, uh, from the time he became Smithsonian secretary to the time he left. And he died only three years later in 1906 of a very broken man. 
Um, it's really very sad what happened to him. He was denounced on the floor of Congress. The only thing he made fly was the public's money. The Wright brothers continued uh, developing their aircraft. In 1904, they built a new one. Uh, they were able to fly in a complete circle. And in 1905, they were turning in flights of um, 38 kilometers under the full control of the pilot, coming down only when they ran out of gas. The 1905 machine was their first, uh, the first ever heavier than air practical airplane. And one day they, you know, they noticed somebody standing by the edge of the field watching them. And it turns out, who, who didn't come over and speak to them, but it turns out it was Charles Manley. So there we have the story of the epic race to be first to fly the airplane. Um, these are men of extraordinary courage and ability. It's a fascinating case study of what makes one team uh, successful, what makes another team not as successful. It shows you the risks of trying you know, what can happen when you're in territory that no one's ever gone before. Um, and to me, they're all heroes. I admire them all. Um, human endeavor like this is, is messy. There's no guarantees, but there's absolute chance of failure if you don't try. And so I hope you take that away. I hope you were able to come to Washington, D.C. sometime and see the reconstructed Grand Aerodrome. It's a beautiful, beautiful machine at the Hazy Center, the Udvar Hazy Center out of Dulles, and of course, see the famous 1903 flyer in Washington, DC.